In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We welcome you to our Perseverance family. And as always, we invite Mary to be with us because Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Let's beg Mary to be with us, to pray with us, to encourage us by her motherly presence as we celebrate the feast day of the Holy Innocents. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's invite now our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He has many titles. And among the titles of the Holy Spirit, he's the paraclete. He's also known as the counselor. He is known as our Consoler. He's also known as the Finger of God. He's also known as the Interior Master. What a beautiful title. The Interior Master because St. Paul says we really don't know how to pray as we ought, but it's the Holy Spirit that intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. And Abba means Daddy. So we're going to turn to our spiritual director to be with us. Within our own hearts, the Holy Spirit is the interior guest of the soul. Let's beg the Holy Spirit to be with us, to give us a lot of light, a lot of peace, a lot of joy, a lot of insight as we go deeper into our faith in our Perseverance family. So let's sing to the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, all afresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, all afresh on me, now on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us. Fill us, <clears throat> use us, Spirit of the living God, all afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, Pray for us. St. Nasha Leola, pray for us. 
St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. Holy God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So you welcome all to our Perseverance family. And just a recap of where we are in the uh, context of the church. Friday, we celebrated the very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful birthday of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You never forget the reason for the season, the purpose of Christmas is the gift, the gift that God the Father gave to us. And that gift is not a material gift. The gift is a person. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his name indicates the purpose of why he came. <clears throat> his name is Jesus. What his name means is Savior. He came to save us from sin, from slavery, from death, from the devil, from eternal damnation. So we thank our Lord. We thank our Lord for coming to save us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, St. Joseph. Then, the day after Christmas, we celebrated St. Stephen. And it's very interesting, the week after Christmas, we have a series of martyrs, which we'll be talking about today. Is that Jesus eventually would die on the cross to save us, shedding his precious blood for us. But December 26th, we celebrated St. Stephen, known as the proto-martyr. This great man of God suffered intensely because his cranium, his skull, was crushed with stones. But he had great love for God. And he had this great love for the poor. He knew the word of God very well. He was an excellent in what is called apologetics. He really knew how to defend his faith. He was courageous against the attacks of his enemies. And he dies almost like Jesus dies, saying, Father, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, practicing mercy. And as a result of that, according to St. Fulgentius of Ruspe, which is the second reading for the Liturgy of the Hours, Saul concurred, he accepted this death of Stephen. And as a result of the prayers of Stephen, we'll eventually have the conversion of Saul, of Tarsus, who becomes the great apostle St. Paul. So we want to ask St. Stephen to pray for us, that we would know our faith, love our faith, defend our faith, and be willing even to die for our faith. Then yesterday, <coughs> we celebrated a Holy Family. The Holy Family is Jesus, the perfect Son, Mary, the perfect mother and wife, and St. Joseph, the per perfect father, as well as husband. Here's a beautiful prayer that uh, I invite all of you to learn in honor of the Holy Family. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, make my heart like unto yours. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, 
assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I breathe forth my soul unto thee. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. That's a beautiful prayer that I've said for many years in honor of the, of the Holy Family. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, make my heart like unto yours. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I breathe forth my soul unto thee. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, O praise and all thanksgiving, be every moment thine. Amen. So on the feast day of Holy Family, we honored Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. In my homily for the Mass yesterday, I spoke about how can we fortify our own families. And I'll give you a brief summary of the five points I made so that we can fortify our families and we'll get into the topic for the day. We're all called to work on strengthening our families. Vatican II mentions that the family is the domestic church. John Paul II says that the family is the basic building block of society, the basic cell of society. John Paul II also said that the way the family goes is the way the society goes. So a, a sign of a healthy society are when families are strong. And the church has always promoted big families. Big families. So the first thing I said is, if we want to have strong families, God has to be in the very center of the family. I repeat, God has to be in the very center of the family. Our families have to be God-centered, Christocentric. That's going to come about when families pray together. You've heard what Father Patrick Payton says. The family that prays together stays together. <clears throat> in John Paul II, in his apostolic letter, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Rosary, 2002, said we should be praying the Rosary every day. This document came out shortly after the attacks in the Twin Tower in New York. And they said we have to pray for world peace as well as for the family. For that reason, Father Patrick Payton said, the family that prays together stays together as well as a family at prayer, rather a world at prayer is a world at peace. Second point I made in trying to form good families is trying to cultivate the domestic virtues. St. Thomas Guanda speaks about the domestic virtues, affability, kindness, courtesy, and I mentioned that we have in our family, we have to learn how to say these, these expressions that, that condiment our, our life. We should have to learn how to say, please, thank you, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. Please, thank you, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. Those are the, the condiments, the condiments of our family life. You know, a salad, I mentioned the idea of a, the, a good salad 
<clears throat> from Olive Garden, if you have a salad without any condiments, the salad is not as as appetizing. So in our family is kind of like an Olive Garden salad. We have to condiment it with uh, the social ingredients of kindness, thanks, you're welcome, please, I'm sorry, I forgive you. The next point I made in fortifying the family is we have to learn to have meal time together. We have to learn how to listen and how to converse with our family members. As a New Year's proposal, I would suggest that you have meal time every day. It may not be a long time, but a good half hour together. And turn off all the electronic devices. Because the human person is more important than the apparatus. You might have to learn the art of dialogue. Yesterday I said uh, the art of dialogue is something that has to be learned. It's like, like playing baseball. If I were to play catch with you, if you've never played catch before, I'd throw the ball, it'd probably hit you in the head. You have to learn the art of lifting up your glove, catching it, taking the ball out, and throwing it. So dialogue, <clears throat> conversation, is an art that we have to learn. It's an art that we have to learn. The family that prays together stays together. The family eats together stays together also. That should be the time during the day in which you connect emotionally with your children. The emotional bond with your children. Yes. Then I mentioned the importance of not holding on to resentment. Because family members are going to be hurting each other. We have to learn how to forgive. Practicing mercy. Jesus said, be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. The Our Father, we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the Catholic English poet Alexander Pope expressed it with these words. To err is human, to forgive is divine. We're all going to make mistakes. We have to learn to ask for forgiveness, and also we have to learn how to forgive. And really, this is the truth. What cancer is to the human body, resentment is to our soul. We don't get the cancer out, we die. We don't expel resentment from our souls by mercy and forgiveness. That's going to eat away at us. And eventually that's going to destroy us. It will eat away at us and it can actually destroy us. An unresolved conflict and resentment in the family that fosters coldness, bitterness, gossip, sarcasm, cutting words, so by forgiving, we set the captive free, and that captive can be ourselves. The last thing I said was by means of giving a summary of a book that was written by a housewife a few years back. The name of the book was, Are You Seeking for Peace? Why Not Try Confession? By Marian Budnick. In this book, she speaks about the benefits of confession. One chapter, very interesting, 
Marion Budnick made this observation in her own family life. <clears throat> she noticed that when her children were bickering, quarreling, fighting with each other, it's because the family had not gone to confession in a long time. And she recognized time to go to confession. So she would go to confession with her family, with her kids, and afterward there was peace and calm. So one of the ultimate sources of tension in our lives is sin and holding on to sin. So confession is a means by which we liberate ourselves. We liberate, we free ourselves from the cancer, the contagion, the leprosy of sin. So those were the five suggestions I made in my homily so that all of us can work on fortifying, strengthening our families. If you're taking notes, here are the big five. Prayer, put God in the center. Second, the social virtues, learning to say thank you, please, I'm sorry, forgive. The third is we have to learn how to listen to each other and converse, mealtime. Fourth is do not hold on to resentment. Learn to forgive and forgive and to ask for forgiveness. Last but not least, try to cultivate the habit of frequent confession. Family members that receive absolution confession will experience interior peace. Shalom means peace be with you. They'll be able to give that peace to others. So my friends, that's a brief summary of where we're at. Okay, today, <clears throat> December 28th, the church celebrates the feast of the Holy Innocents, martyrs. So I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief summary of the first reading taken from the first letter of St. John. This is what he says. And it's related to who Jesus is what his name means, and how we have to apply this to ourselves. The name Jesus means Savior. He came to, he came to save us of our sins. And St. John says this, if we say that we have no sin, then the truth of God is not in our hearts. But if we do sin, then we do have a Savior. And that Savior is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is an advocate before God the Father. And I think that this, this first reading today, it's very simple, but it's very applicable today. Because if some Catholic says, I have no sin, what is the purpose of the incarnation, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came for that reason, he came, Jesus Christ came to save us from the devil, from the fires of hell, but he also came to save us from sin. All of us are sinners, 
But good news, there is a doctor in the house. And that doctor is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Only the Blessed Virgin Mary, by means of her Immaculate Conception, Mary had no sin. And also Jesus is the sinless one. <clears throat> He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Aside from that, all of us are sinners. Pope Pius XII said, The sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. I repeat, Pope Pius XII says, The sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. I think it's happened to all of you. In the past, it's Saturday afternoon. You're getting up. Maybe you've got some relatives or some friends that are visiting you. And it's maybe about 4.30 and you're getting up, going out the door. And one of your relatives saying, where are you going? Say, I'm going to church. And the relative or friend says, why are you going to church? It's Saturday. You go to church, not on Saturday, but on Sunday. And you say, well, I'm going because I go to confession every month. And your relative says, well, what have you done? What have you done that you're such a bad person that you have to go to confession every month? You say, because I'm a sinner. And then you tell your relative or friend who's a Catholic, if you want, there's enough room in the car, you can come with me. Me? I haven't done anything. I haven't killed anyone. I haven't robbed a bank. So I think this first reading today is very applicable today. As Pope Pius XII said that in the 40s, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. We become desensitized and we no longer sin unless we drop a bomb or rob a bank. So let's pray that our conscience will become all the more refined. You know, because the, the, the closer we get to the light, the more we're able to see the black spots on our white shirt. But the further we drift away from the light, the more we can't even see the big coffee stains or the chocolate stains on our white shirt. Our white shirt. <clears throat> on our white shirt. So that reading today, read through it, meditate upon it. It's taken from the first, le first letter of St. John. So let's talk now about the feast day that we celebrate today. Today we celebrate the feast day of Holy Innocence. I'd we'll like to give you the biblical passage and then let's talk about the application. Remember I taught, I was teaching you a good method for you to utilize when you're doing your holy hour are five steps. Read, read, lectio, read, memorize, general interpretation, personal interpretation, personal application. I repeat, read, read, memorize, general application, personal application, and then 
putting into practice in your life. So let's go through the biblical passage, the biblical context. The holy innocence is actually related to the feast day of the Epiphany, sometimes known as the feast day of the kings. So let me try to give you the overall biblical context and then the interpretation. Let's try to interpret this for ourselves and try to do something. In the context of the Christmas season, we celebrate what is called the Epiphany, sometimes known as the Feast Day of the Kings, which will be celebrated next Sunday. And the whole thrust of this beautiful Feast Day is the kings that possibly came from Persia were very religious people. And they were studious. They would study. Now, they were observing the, the constellation, the stars, and the Holy Spirit had enlightened them to the fact that a certain star in the sky would lead them to the Savior. So they traveled, possibly in camels, a long way. And instead of arriving at <clears throat> Jesus, they're led to the palace of a wicked king. And the name of this wicked king, his name is Herod. His name is Herod. And this wicked King Herod, seeing these exotic kings coming from the east, he listens to them and they say, we have heard that the newborn king will be born in Bethlehem. We have seen his star. And they say, where is him? Where is he? And Herod and all of his household are in consternation. They're perplexed. They're confused. And then King Herod dismisses them and says, well, when you find them, how cunning he is, tell me where he is so that I can also go to worship him. Here you have Kerid, he's a, a wicked, wily, cunning, deceitful, insecure, vicious, malicious king. So they head off, and this is the hope of Herod. <clears throat> He's hoping that they will ascertain where this newborn king is born. And Herod being so insecure, Herod being so insecure, he decides that once he finds this king, then he'll eliminate him. That was already in the back of his mind infanticide to kill this child. So they head off and they follow the star and they're led to where Jesus is in the arms of Mary. And they get off their animals they're camels, most likely. And they prostrate themselves to him. 
And they offer him three gifts. Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because Jesus is king. They recognize that he's king. Frankincense because he is God. Offering incense to God. And myrrh because he is man. And in his humanity, he is destined to suffer and die for our salvation. So after spending time with Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph, the kings are warned in a dream not to return by the same route. It's interesting the importance of the angels in the life of these kings, as well as in the life of St. Joseph. <clears throat> so, they're warned in a dream not to return by the same route. And this wicked King Herod, of course, was waiting for their return. But once he's aware of the fact that he was deceived by them, that they don't return to his palace, King Herod not only is angry, but he is infuriated. He's infuriated. And what he decides to do, it's not over. He's going to win the battle. This newborn king is not going to be a king. He's not going to take Herod's place. And of course, Jesus did not have that intention anyway to be an earthly powerful king. But Herod was so insecure that he decided quickly to eliminate these children, and they would be two-year-old boys and younger, that he would send his soldiers to massacre them. So the feast day today is very, <clears throat> very powerful. <clears throat> What's happening at the same time is the wise men The wise men, they are heading back to their country by another route. Almost at the same time, you have good St. Joseph. We celebrated yesterday the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. Who is called to protect and, def and to defend the Holy Family. As one of the saints says, he became the savior of the savior. St. Joseph became the savior of the savior. I really like that. It's written in Father Donald Calloway's book on consecration of St. Joseph. He becomes the savior of the savior. And so St. Joseph has another dream. And the angel tells St. Joseph, get up in the middle of the night and take the child into Egypt because the wicked King Herod wants to destroy the child. St. Joseph, obedient, obeys right away. And he gets up with Mary and the child Jesus probably takes a few provisions and obeys and goes to a place that he probably would have never thought of. To Egypt. The Egyptians, who did not really like the Jews, had to cross the desert 
going to a country where he didn't know their language, going to a country where there was no home for him, going to a country leaving his profession as a carpenter, we see the incredible faith and trust, faith and trust of good Saint Joseph, obedient to the will of God, obedient to the will of God. And here we have it, the soldiers of King Herod go to Bethlehem in the regions, going into the homes, checking out if there are any baby boys. They end up by slaughtering. This morning I was studying a little bit on this in between maybe 20 and 25 little innocent boys. Bethlehem was not that big, but even if it were one child, that would be one too many. It ends up by slaughtering 20 to 25 little innocent babies. And the mothers are weeping as they see these soldiers with their swords, slaughtering these little babies. What suffering, what weeping, what sobbing. How much intense suffering there was. Mothers having these babies ripped out of their arms. And cutting their throats stabbing these little children it's just diabolic it's brutal it's ugly in the church for time memorial memorial has interpreted this passage in such a way <clears throat> that these little children even though they couldn't speak they couldn't understand, they couldn't defend themselves. These are considered among the first martyrs in the Christian faith. They're considered martyrs, even though they didn't fully, obviously fully understand what, 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 was, what was going on. But indeed, these children are called martyrs because a martyr is an individual that sheds his blood for Jesus Christ, sheds his blood to defend Jesus Christ, sheds his blood to defend the church. Sheds his blood also to defend some type of virtue. Like St. Maria Goretti, she was a martyr because she would not give in to the impure passions and desires of Alessandro Serenelli. So these are among the first martyrs in the Catholic Church. We celebrate them today and we invoke their precious blood and of course the precious blood that they shed they said that they shed was to protect jesus 33 years later jesus will be a young man and he will be shedding every drop of his blood for the salvation of the world so i think it's very interesting that the week, the Christmas week, we have a series of martyrs. The martyrdom of St. Stephen, stoned to death. The martyrdom of the Holy Innocents today. 
Tomorrow, which is December 29th, we celebrate the martyrdom of St. Thomas Becket, who was murdered in the cathedral. Then we have the martyrdom of St. Sylvester Pope, the last day of the year. Very interesting. In a certain sense, we celebrate Christmas. It's not a sentimental, saccharine, sweet feast day, but Jesus was born. As St. Ignatius says, he was born to die. He was born to die. He was born to die so as to give us life. And how would Jesus die? Jesus would die by shedding his precious blood for us on the cross on Calvary. So this, my friends, <clears throat> is the feast day that we celebrate today. And it's the feast day of holy innocence. Now, obviously, when we celebrate the feast day of holy innocence, then almost immediately the obvious general interpretation of this feast day of killing these innocent babies is related to the reality of the biggest moral problem, the biggest moral problem we have in the country and in the world. And that is what? You know it. It's the reality of abortion. See the connection here. As King Herod brutally, viciously, maliciously, cold-heartedly, he massacred these innocent babies, ripping them from the arms of their mothers, killing an innocent baby. So also, what is abortion? Abortion, my friends, is really, it's the same thing. The only difference is that these babies were already born. But the abortion is killing the babies that are simply not born yet, but they're still babies. They're human beings. They're created in the image and likeness of God. The only difference between those babies and the babies in the womb and the babies outside the womb are more developed. But we maintain, as men and women of life, that we have to think about that reality of abortion today and pray over it. Then, in another three weeks, we, January 21st, we call to mind the saddest day in the history of our country, in which 1973, January 21st, Roe v. Wade legalized the killing of innocent babies, legalizing infanticide. Legalize, legalizing killing innocent people that cannot defend themselves. So the only difference between the baby outside the womb and the baby within the womb is simply that the one outside the womb is bigger and more developed.
You have to defend life. And I have to defend life. You have to be the, bo be the voice of the child who cannot defend himself. I have to be the voice of the child who cannot defend himself. They are our little brothers and sisters and they have a right to live. As you and I, we have a right to live. <clears throat> we all know that human and divine life begins when? In the very moment of conception, that's when life begins. I repeat, in the moment of conception, that's when life begins. In the moment of conception, you have the physical reality of that individual that's unique. And the woman cannot say, I can do with my body whatever I want, because it's not her body. It's a new human being. And not only that, but the moment of conception also, that's when God, in his infinite love and wisdom, God infuses. He infuses within that individual an immortal soul. An immortal soul that will be living for all eternity. I repeat an immortal soul that will be living for all eternity. That's where it all begins. And God gives life. God is the author of life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. God gives life, and God takes life away as you read in the book of Job. Naked I came forth from my mother's womb. Naked I returned to the earth. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As from the book of Job, chapter 1. Naked I came forth from my mother's womb. Naked I returned to the earth. The Lord gives the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So I'd like to mention, and this is a very, very extensive topic in which we could be talking about this for a long time. But I'd like to mention one or two things that we can do in defense of the unborn child. One is practical, the other is spiritual. Let's start with a practical thing. One of the most famous converts from promoting abortion to defending human life is Dr. Bernard Nathanson. I repeat, his name is Dr. Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And he was a Jewish born doctor who headed one of the most renowned abortion centers in the whole world. And it was in the city of New York. So much so that Dr. Bernard Nathanson was given the nickname, the King of Abortion. 
And he was responsible, my friends, for 80,000 abortions. Imagine that. 80,000 abortions. But God intervened in this way. This is back in the 70s that he was viewing an ultrasound. He was viewing an ultrasound. And this was what <clears throat> about about 45 45 years ago. And obviously the ultrasound was much more primitive than today. But by looking at it, he could see this, this baby in the womb of a mother. The baby moving. And all the details of the little baby moving within the womb. And God's grace struck him there like soil of Tarsus. In that moment, he believed that's not simply a glob of tissue. That is a human person. From that moment on, Dr. Bernard Nathanson never carried out another abortion in his life. On the contrary, he became one of the strongest advocates of the pro-life movement. So much so to the extent that he actually was able to work in putting together a movie. This is probably the most famous pro-life movement movie 40 years ago. And the name of the movie was, and still is, you can get it. It's called The Silent Scream. Okay, The Silent Scream by Dr. Bernard Nathanson. The Silent Scream is because when the instruments go into the body of the woman, and are yanking the body of the baby out through the suction method or the scalpel method. There are many different methods. Then the baby actually experiences the pain. The baby actually experiences the great pain of being rent asunder and being ripped out of the womb of the mother. The baby's mouth opens up and the baby's screaming out. Mommy, save me. But it's too late. And to make a long story short, this doctor of Jewish descent was baptized by Cardinal John O'Connor in St. Patrick's Cathedral. He was baptized. He made his first communion, was confirmed. And about three years ago, he was, I think, in his late 80s, he, he passed away. And it's because he was able to see the graphic image of the baby. So the one suggestion I'd like you to make, and I'd make to you is the use of ultrasounds. If you know any women that are confused, get them to view an ultrasound. So by seeing their baby, they will say yes to life. And spiritually, my friends, we have to pray. Pray the Hail Mary. Bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray to Mary, Our Lady Guadalupe, that we would be people of life, that we will be the voice of the child who cannot defend himself. And let God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.